Dr. Ramani, can you define normal anxiety for me? Normal anxiety is appropriate to the situation. It's, it's worry, it's a response to uncertainty. Um, if a person is facing a stressor where there's an unknown, an exam, a deadline at work, there should be some worry. It motivates us. In fact, a normal curve that associates anxiety and performance, it shows it's an upside down U. There's a top of that curve. You get optimized performance. That's where anxiety is sort of at this perfect mid-level, just enough to get you off your butt and make sure you study and your mind is sharp. So anxiety can actually enhance performance to a degree. It sets some stakes in there. And then again, if we're having a stressor in our life, it's appropriate to be anxious because it leads us to mobilize resources. We don't say, ah, I got an exam. I think I'm going to take a nap. We're like, I have an exam. I better study. I better focus. And it activates us. So that's normal anxiety. It's appropriate worry about the things in life and that when that issue resolves, we sort of let go of some of that anxiety and move on to the next thing. If we stay in a situation of anxiety for too long, almost like our sympathetic nervous systems, our fight or flight is activated for a long time, that's not good for our health. Mm. It releases stress hormones, it wears us down physically and psychologically. So there's a point at which when the thing we're worried about passes, that we let it go. That's normal anxiety. We all have some of it. It's what gets us out of bed in the morning. And so I, I think there's a lot of people that would say or think that we shouldn't have anxiety. No. Anytime no, 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 they no. feel anxious, mm -hmm. they go, oh, this is bad. This shouldn't be happening. We're all going to, I mean, in, in the modern world, we're all going to have a little bit. I have to say it's getting worse because now we even have anxieties around what do people think of my social media posts and things that, that that to me that's actually rather wasted anxiety. It's really about things that have to do with maybe survival needs, taking care of your family, taking care of your job, making sure that things are sort of running on time and when that's that demand is higher for us to be a little anxious, like I said, it can enhance performance. But to live with no anxiety, that would be a little bit problematic because anxiety also creates a little bit of a, a check and a balance system in us. It makes us aware, self-aware and aware of others. Like, I want to make sure I say the right thing. I want to make sure that I'm on time. Mm -hmm. Like, there's an awareness of it. We, when we talk about the absolute absence of anxiety, we're actually talking about psychopathy. A person worries about, like, hey, I'm willing to take your wallet and shoot you because I'm not worried. Yeah. You know, that's the most extreme example of it. Obviously, when you're just having a good day and things are moving along, you don't need to expend that much worry. I wouldn't call it anxiety if you're saying, oh, I want to be on time to school. You get in the car, you go. That's something you have overlearned. But if it's a day you have a test and if you're late, for example, mm -hmm. and being late will mean you'll have less time on the test. That anxiety might mobilize you to say, I better leave a half hour earlier today. You might feel that little churning in your tummy. If that enhances performance, it's not a bad thing. So um, you're using the example of a test, and mm -hmm. when I was in college, a lot of people said, oh, I get a lot of anxiety uh -huh. around tests. Yep. I did too, mm -hmm. but it didn't inhibit me. Right. Are there people who can have too much anxiety Absolutely. for a test? In fact, test anxiety and treatment programs on test anxiety, they're all over universities. They're offered all the time. And it can get so bad that the person freezes, freezes during the right. test and then they don't pass. And it's not really a valid indicator of how much they know that material. And that's heartbreaking to witness. So there'll be all kinds of programs, including time management, breathing, preparation, sitting in the right part of the classroom. I mean, all kinds of techniques, but a lot of it's self-talk. So uh, from a simple standpoint, anxiety is normal and it's not bad unless it is causing you to go through some uh, undesirable consequence. Yes, unless it's causing you a sense of subjective distress. So you feel uncomfortable. Okay. I don't want to feel like this. Or it's causing you some form of impairment. You're not doing well in the test. It's getting in the way of your relationships. People are like, you need to stop. You're obsessing over this. Got Other it. people are noticing. It's when we call that when it causes significant distress or impairment. That's when we start thinking of the anxiety as a problem. As a disorder. As a disorder. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, when can someone have an anxiety disorder without ever have gone, gone through normal anxiety first? So the idea that when a person has an anxiety disorder, they likely have always run somewhat anxious. If you sort of scroll back 
on the life histories of people who have anxiety disorders, you're going to probably see a pretty tightly wound kid. Mm. They tended to be anxious as children. They'd be anxious about school performance. They'd be anxious about their friends. They might be anxious about what other people think about them. So you would see a person who probably temperamentally ran anxious all their lives. Now, how much of that was inborn? How much of that they may have learned from their families? They might have had an anxious parent. That, you know, obviously to fully tease that apart is difficult, but anxiety tends to be sort of a lifelong pattern that can get really enhanced in adulthood and blow up in adulthood and become more of a disorder. And you can see teenagers, maybe to some degree children, who have anxiety disorders as well. At any point in life, we can develop anxiety disorder. Yes, and that's where anxiety disorders are very, very interesting and quite different than a lot of other mental illnesses. For example, if you look at a disorder like bipolar disorder, mm -hmm. at the age of 40, someone's not gonna wake up and then develop bipolar disorder. That's something that would have been set probably by their late teens, early to mid 20s. With an anxiety disorder, it is quite possible that a person could develop a phobia later in life, a person could develop generalized anxiety disorder later in life, a person could develop panic disorder later in life. That can happen. It's still not normative. By mm. and large, a lot of these paths do get set earlier in life. However, life happens. And let's say a person all of a sudden experiences tons of stresses, a divorce, the loss of a job, a house burns down, whatever happens, family member gets sick, and it just gets all to be too much, it's not unusual for a person. to have that happen. In fact, generalized anxiety disorder, the average age of onset is about 30, 31. That's a later onset than most mental illnesses, and that's probably because it averages out. There's people out there who are having their, their onset later in life, 40 or 50 years of age. Wow, yeah. the average age for generalized anxiety disorder. Onset. Onset. 30, 31. 30, 30, 31, which is late for mental illness. Wow. Yeah, which makes sense. Life is starting to happen, right? Yes. You're no longer Your 20s the college. Are over. Yes, you're yeah. no longer a college kid going to a keg party. You're like, yeah. ooh, there's these things called bills, and I've yeah. got to get a job, and the world expects something of me. I'm supposed to get married. The expectations start ratcheting up, and that's where sort of the rubber meets the road on the anxiety disorder. Really yeah. fascinating. that anxiety is the most common mental health disorder mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and it often is co-occurring with other yes. mental health problems. What yes. other co-occurring diagnosis do you see anxiety with? Most commonly, you'll see anxiety disorders co-occur with a mood disorder. So anxiety and depression together mm -hmm. is a very common combination. There are theorists out there that actually think that the division between anxiety and depression is somewhat artificial, that it's similar processes in the brain, and that in some ways it's just a manifestation difference, where one person might become very sad, another person might become very worried. And in fact, rumination is often a big part of depression. So that's almost like difficult to tease out, but we'll often see those two hanging out together. What is rumination? Rumination is when you sort of get stuck in a obsessive rut of thinking, typically about the same thing over and over and over again. You can't let it go. It could be something that happened at work and you can't stop thinking about it. It could be a falling out with a friend and you can't stop weighing it in your mind, an argument you had with a partner, and you just can't break out of it. For people, it's normal for a little while to say, God, I wish I didn't say that, or I wish that didn't happen, or how could she have done that? Mm -hmm. But then over time, other stuff comes and we, we sort of let it go and we move forward. For a person who's ruminating, they can't let go. And they'll do that with everything. It'll be, did I look at that person the wrong way? Did I park in the wrong place? Did uh, Do you think they like me? Should did I say the wrong thing? It tends to be more self, in anxiety, it tends to be more self-blaming stuff. Did I do the wrong thing? Did I make them uncomfortable? So it, it doesn't, It's that's where it has a, a very specific flavor to it that we'd almost label as neurotic. For how long does someone have to ruminate for it to be considered neurotic or too much? Same thing, is it getting in the way of their lives? Right. That's where we would, you know, and, and here's where it gets challenging. Some people ruminate a lot and they start withdrawing. 
they start keeping to themselves. They don't talk to other people as much. They cut out from their lives. Mm -hmm. So we may not even notice it as much. But people around them might say, hey, we have, this person hasn't come around. Have they called you? They're not showing up to family gatherings. They're fam they're, if they live with people, they'll notice a change. So it might be just other people noticing changes in their rhythms. But when that rumination gets in the way, they can't talk or think about anything else. And it's really causing them problems at work with friends, family, that's when we start paying attention. Do you think that people are aware that the rumination mm -hmm. is getting in the way of their life? I do, I do they think do. people are aware. A in anxiety disorders, insight is very preserved. People know this is too much. They can't stop it, but they're the first ones to say, I know this is disproportionate and I can't stop it. And that's where anxiety disorders can be rather paralyzing because the person feels like they can't let it go. They can't stop worrying. It's a very helpless feeling. So and it's that very would give me anxiety, I yes, feel like. Yes, exactly, it's a feedback loop. Wow. It just keeps going and going and it just it sort of spirals. And that's where it's so painful because I think I see people and no matter how many times you try to give them the opposite, the sort of counter argument, if you will, they will, they're still sort of stuck in their interpretation of events. And a lot of the work in anxiety disorders is helping teach them new interpretations. Now, we've talked about general anxiety. Mm -hmm. How many different types of anxiety are there? There are different types of anxiety disorders. The most common are actually the phobias. And the mm. phobias are sort of divided into three groups. The specific phobias, social phobia, which we now call social anxiety disorder, and agoraphobia, which is sort of on its own because it often hangs out with its friend panic disorder. Panic disorder is another form of anxiety disorder. Then there's generalized anxiety disorder. So these disorders are all characterized by anxiety being the key element of the disorder. The phobias have a very specific form of avoidance associated with them. So people with phobias avoid the thing that they're afraid of. People with panic disorder have a very strong physiological um, experience, which can lead them then to pull out of life because they're having these panic attacks. And then finally, generalized anxiety disorder is sort of a wide-ranging, wide-reaching anxiety about a variety of issues, but it really has to be around for a long time, for about six months or so. So let's say a person's going through a rough time, like their mom is sick and in the hospital and they're worrying about everything. Who's gonna pick up the kids? Who's gonna to go to the hospital? If that only lasts for three or four weeks, we wouldn't diagnose that as generalized anxiety disorder. We look at it being over a wide range of activities, sort of um, disproportionate to the level of the stimulus and very persistent. You mentioned agoraphobia. Mm -hmm. What is that? Agoraphobia. <laughs> People sometimes think it's the fear of open spaces, as though oh. a person's like, I refuse to go into a field. Yeah. It's not. It's fear of being in places from which escape would be difficult, help would be difficult to get, and there's a possibility that they could embarrass themselves. But that didn't get its own category, right? Agoraphobia is its own. It's its form, own. Its own yeah, but you'll ne agoraphobia almost 90% of the time co occurs with panic disorder. And think about it, if a person is starting to have recurring panic attacks and they don't know when those panic attacks are gonna happen, in other words, they're spontaneous, then what happens is they get scared. I don't wanna to go to the grocery store and have this happen. I don't want this to happen in a movie theater. I don't want this to happen in the middle of the warehouse where I'm at work or at school. So what would the person start doing? they'd stop going to those Stay things. Home. And one day before you know it, they could look up and say, I haven't left the house for months. Because they, do, or if they do go out of the house, it'll only be if somebody's willing to go with them and stay with them and reassure them. Mm. So it's, that's how that, so it's very specific. It's that fear of being in situations where help may not be readily available or escape won't be easy. Wow, that sounds so difficult. It's so debilitating. It's debilitating, heartbreaking. Debilitating, that's the word It's really, for. really heartbreaking because Agoraphobia, that agoraphobia panic combination can often occur when a person has a significant stress or loss in their life. So for example, someone in their life dies or they go through a really stressful interpersonal experience like a painful divorce. That can be accompanied by panic attacks and then before you know it, that person will find themselves having almost completely cut out from life. So they're missing out on the opportunity for connecting with other people, for coping. And nowadays, I'm gonna be honest with you, Kyle, agoraphobia is getting easier because people can Amazon Prime it, they can order stuff online, they can get on social media, so they can almost get that sense of, eh, I'm in the world, but they're not leaving their house where the fear of a panic attack always looms. So and it's are, an and interesting time. are they time. aware that, they're, that, that, they're, that they haven't left the house in a month? Oh yeah, 
And that's then that way. feeds the anxiety. Yes, because yes. Because like, oh gosh, I haven't yeah. left the house in a month. And as with so many mental illnesses, what's heartbreaking is there sometimes can be a sense of shame. You right. know, and, and that's the devastation that, you know, as I'll always say on Med Circle, there's nothing to be ashamed of. These are all sort of the things that happen to human beings and people won't leave and then they'll sort of withdraw even more. So that's also, that's, that can also get really, really tricky because part of being a human being is even the little things of life, going, going, even going on a walk around the neighborhood mm -hmm. starts to become very difficult. Mm. Well, I, I love, I forget which video it was that we've done, but you said that all of these diagnoses, whether it was a panic disorder, general mm -hmm. anxiety, social phobia, mm -hmm. it's just the tool to find the right treatment. Yes. It's not this label mm -hmm. that we go, hey, this is who yeah. you are now, so yeah. sorry yeah, about that's it. Right. That's it's just right. go, this is the steps, so yeah. we know the steps to yeah. take after. Mm -hmm. that's and exactly that right. gives me like that's some it. stress, some right. stress relief. Well, the difficulty is, is that sadly in our society, mental illnesses and these labels still carry some stigma. Mm -hmm. So if you went to the doctor's office and they say, ah, oh, you have a bacterial infection, you'd be like, cool, I'll you can get my antibiotic, go home, go to bed, That's take right. some, but you, if you go and see a mental health practitioner and you're told you have an anxiety disorder, or social anxiety disorder, you might feel like, you know, you'll, you'll cringe at it. It's not exactly what you consider dinner table conversation. And to me, whether a person has a flu, arthritis, a stomach ulcer or depression, they're just illnesses. That's right. And they're all manageable and they don't define the person. So I think for people to understand, this is not just the person who's a quivering nerve in the corner, that this can have many manifestations and that then people feel embarrassed. Well, no one's gonna believe I'm socially anxious, I'm on TV, right. you know? And so it helps people see that there's a wide range to this. I've, I've worked with clients who are actually brilliant salespeople and socially anxious. Mm, I get it. You know, and to me, doing a sale would I would I could I would have I would mm. I would have a panic attack mm. if I had to sell something, but I could speak in front of ten thousand people. Yeah. We've talked a lot about what anxiety is, the different types of anxieties. What isn't anxiety? Mm -hmm. Okay. What is not? What is not anxiety is no, what we call normal anxiety. Being worried when it's uh, being worried when it's April 14th and you haven't started your taxes. That's not an anxiety disorder. That's like start worrying now. Yes. You know, this is it's the, you know, two hours before a final exam and you haven't studied yet. Worry. So when you say, oh gosh, I'm worried about my exams, I must have an anxiety disorder. No. If a person says, I'm really afraid of snarling dogs, we're not gonna call that a phobia. Okay? If a person says, I don't want to go to a theme park, but I'm willing to go to a movie theater, grocery store. That's not agoraphobia. So they don't tend to be that selective. Anxiety disorders, by definition, tend to be more sweeping. So this idea that I'm afraid of one thing may not mean you have a phobia. A person who says, I don't like big parties, may not mean you have social anxiety disorder. Mm. So it really is a matter of degree. It's also a matter of how much it generalizes. Mm. And that's when we think about whether or not it's truly an anxiety disorder. Because what we don't want to do is we don't want to medicalize and diagnose and, and sort of label the, the normal, normal responses to difficult situations. Because that's when people start second guessing themselves and saying, well, maybe I'm broken because I'm anxious. I'm like, well, you, you better be anxious. You're going through a lot. That's a very appropriate reaction. So that's where we always want to be careful in all of this. Yeah, I, I like that a lot because if we did start diagnosing every type yeah. of thing, mm -hmm. then it also minimizes the other yes. diagnosis. I think so, I think know. so. And I think people just wonder how much is too much. And then some people are actually living under tremendous amounts of stress, whether it's because they're having trouble keeping up with their income or they're having significant relationship problems or somebody who can't pay down their student debt or something like that. You know, those are big problems. Yeah. And so for, for persons worrying about them and then they think they don't have the right to worry about them, that gets, that's concerning to me because I do think a person has a right to any emotion that they're feeling. Yes, your right to anxiety. Mm -hmm. Yes, I yes like that's right. That. Um, is there any research being done on where anxiety disorder is most prevalent in the world? Interestingly, in the United States, anxiety disorders are the most common form of mental illness. That's not the case all over the world. In much of the rest of the world, de um, mood disorders like major depression 
are the most common. I wonder why. What's the difference? You know, I wonder how much about the American condition. I mean, I think this is a competitive society. Yeah. Um, that there may be some things built into our culture that may foster anxiety. It could be that also that there may be a lower acceptability to endorse depression. And I think many times a person enters a healthcare provider or a mental health care provider's office with sort of generalized medical or uh, psychological issues, I should say. A lot of times they might focus more on the anxiety than mm. on the sadness or something too. But that is an interesting kind of distinction that it is for the United States that the anxiety disorders are the most common, but that's not the case all over the world. Is there any information on which demographic of people may have more or less anxiety? Than Here's anxiety. an interesting one. One thing that has sometimes jumped up in the literature is that sometimes people with more economic resources suffer a little bit more from anxiety. And that may very well be because a big part of anxiety is a sense of control. When your sense of control is being nipped at, mm. that's when you feel more anxious. And there is some belief that people who have chronically been living in poverty or have fewer economic resources, they've almost adjusted to being buffeted by the randomness of life and they don't feel as anxious about it. They're like, oh, it's just another, just another day in paradise, you know? And I sometimes wonder that. I've, I work with students, I take students, for example, to India every year. and. We sometimes see these families li living under stressors that seem insurmountable. Mm. But what I'm not seeing a lot of there often is anxiety. I'm seeing other manifestations, but not the kind of anxiety I certainly would feel if I had the level of uncertainty that they had in their lives. So the sense that I've had a life where I've had some sense of control over things in my life, that means that if any of that control is taken away, my likely response is anxiety, because at some level, I must think I can fix it. Wow. Wow. That it's, it, I know this is so juvenile, but more money, more problems. You know? like Amen, that, boyfriend. That, Amen. That's, that exact, that's, that's the, exactly what it is. That's yeah. exactly what it is. 